What's up, Fit Team? I'm Kaylin Ellsbury, and I'm so excited to be here as part of our family reunion series. Here's the deal. We're going to cover a lot in the next 45 minutes, and it's going to be absolutely mind-blowing, life-altering, transformational for you today in your living rooms, in your kitchen, in your homes, kids running around. So what I want you to do is if you need to hit pause real quick, go ahead, hit pause, and get yourself a notebook. Get yourself a piece of paper. Get yourself a pen light a candle, do what you got to do to get your mind primed. Because what we're about to take you on is going to be an emotional journey. And it's one that I wouldn't stand here and record on my family vacation if I didn't believe in my heart of hearts that this is a message y'all need to take home today. Now, if you're still questioning if you should hit pause and go get the notebook, the pen, the paper, light the candle, what I want to do is I want to ask you this. Have you prayed harder this year than you have prayed any other year of your life? If your answer is yes, girl, I feel you. Go get that candle, hit pause. Okay, welcome back, here's the deal. So we just figured out if you've prayed harder this year than you have any other year in your life. Let me explain something to you. There's something called a crucible. Right now we are in a crucible. A crucible is the term that medieval alchemists used for the vessel that turned the base metals into gold. Okay. Now, what does that actually mean for us today? See, there's a defining moment in somebody's life. It's usually sudden, it's usually unplanned, you have no idea what's about to happen, and more often than not, it's negative. So when you're at a sudden, life-changing, life-altering, transformational moment in your life, and it's not necessarily as positive as you'd like to think, good way to think of it, you're at a crucible event. And see, there's a lot going on behind the crucible. We've all known this, correct me if I'm wrong. We've all known this person that something happens to them and it's a bad situation and they just stay negative. There's no transformation. There's no phoenix rising from the ashes. They just stay kind of in their negative attitude and it impacts every other part of their life. See, there's this thing called a reticular activation system. It's a pencil-like structure. And it's in the back of your brain above your spinal cord. And your RAS, your reticular activation system, it actually is that thing that primes your mind for what you see. So if you ever bought a new car, and then on that road you see that car everywhere, that's your RAS activating. That's how powerful your mind can be. And in a crucible moment, there are certain people out there who it activates their RAS, and then all they see is negativity throughout the entire day. Combine that with what's on the media right now, and people are triggered. We're all very triggered. And our RAS is going constantly looking for more triggers, looking for things. That's how fight and flight is activated. So keep that in mind. There's people that when negative things happen, their RAS gets triggered, and then that's all they see, especially at a crucible moment. Second type of person, it's going to knock them down. It's, it's going to suck. But eventually, they've, they've shown in studies that happiness, after about six months, they tend to go right back to where they were. So we all know this person also, they get a horrible diagnosis. They lose their job. They get furloughed. A, a family member passes. And it's really hard on them for about six months. And that's like nothing, nothing went wrong at all. They're back to being their normal chipper self. Okay, they, they, they hit the neutral zone. Then there's the third type of person. This is the person that I'm hoping I'm speaking to today. Now I can't see you, you know I can't see you. But I'm hoping. That's who I'm talking to right now. You see this third person, a crucible moment happens and they are kicked down. Think of Inky Johnson, perfect example. They are kicked so far down, society doesn't know what's gonna happen to them. But something in their brain starts to click. Something in their brain starts to change and they don't necessarily know what that is. You don't have to know it to experience it. And when that thing happens, when they are kicked down, they are stepped on, they find a truth within themselves. And suddenly they go from people saying, you'll never make it, to can you teach me how you did it? That's what I'm gonna uncover with you today. So by now you've watched the priming video about my background and you know I have a condition called cystic fibrosis. For those of you who aren't aware, cystic fibrosis is a life-threatening genetic condition. So I was born with it. I've never known anything outside of it. And I was 24 hours old and my stomach actually exploded. And uh, they, it's called a meconium ileus, you can look it up. And um, they had to have my intestines in a bag. They were like, this, this kid's done for. 
Um, so I spent the first six months of my life in the neonatal intensive care unit in Iowa City, Iowa City hospitals and clinics. Um, I went to Iowa State, so I'm a cyclone for you Midwestern ladies. So here's the deal. I'm 32 and it can be a matter of a couple of days to where I'm hiking in Yosemite or I'm having a great time with my fiance. We're boating. We live in Southern California, San Diego right now. We can be walking around town and going for jogs in Balboa Park. And in about a 24 to 48 hour window, I can come in contact with an infection. And my lung function goes from roughly 74% to 30. And every single time I have a bag packed, my fiance knows, get, get her to the hospital. Hooked up on oxygen. There's plenty of uh, infections that they, they diagnose from that point. And I go on 24 seven IV drips. Now, my veins are so shot because I have had over 67, 67 hospitalizations in 32 years. So my veins were completely shot and they couldn't find access with the needle anymore. They had to install a port. Um, a port is basically, it's just a catheter and it's in my chest right above, right here. And they just hook a three quarter inch long needle. They just jam it into you. And uh, that's how I'm hooked up to antibiotics for immediate vein access. In the last few years, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be real with you. I feel like I kind of had some great conversations with the leaders. I wanna just be real with you this time. Um, the particular strain of infection I have, there's no more treatments for. I am now allergic to every single treatment there is. Now, I'm very fortunate that I have a lot of great medicine. I've got a lot of great mindset tactics. I went on to get my master's practitioner in something called neurolinguistic programming. So I studied mind over medicine quite extensively. And I, I really work to heal people from the inside out. So although the diagnosis and prognosis is grim, it is not hopeless. It's not hopeless at all. And so whenever these infections start, we never know. I just go down and I keep climbing myself back up. And I've had 67 hospitalizations in 32 years. Most recently, it was about six months ago. Um, so I wanted to give you that backstory because let's just say you were born today, today with this condition. And you realize I'm 32. You'll find online if you're born today, you will live to be about 37. So let's do the math. 89% of my life has been lived. 89% of my life is over. So, you know those speakers, they come out and they always talk to you and they go, oh, well, if this was your last day on earth, what would you do? Every keynote I do, I do with the intention that this is the last message that any of you may see. And that's why it's real and that's why it's honest. I'm gonna challenge you a bit on this message. Because I want you to get this. You see, I was 25 years old, 25 years old, when I had a six-figure corporate career. I was doing executive headhunting and recruiting. And I was doing it for a South Florida-based healthcare recruiting company. Now, I'd started off doing the recruiting. Oh, that was pretty good. I, you know, I'd like to think I'm good, right? All my ladies who know the sales process, you're like, yeah, I know when I'm good. I was good. <laughs> In fact, I was so good that I got a little cocky. And I one day walked up to the CEO and I go, hey, out of curiosity, I noticed your churn rate's incredible. You know, you've got employees coming in, employees coming out, and it's fast, it's rapid, especially in recruiting. Why don't you have a corporate recruiter bringing in these employees that you're compensating on their behalf? And he goes, you are absolutely fired. And I go, well, shoot. <laughs> there was other words, of course. And he let me go. And I was like, oh my gosh, now I've got all these medical bills. I'm spending up to six months a year in the hospital and I lost my career. And then in that same breath, he goes, by the way, do you want a job as a corporate recruiter? <laughs> I'm like, well played, bro. All right, I'm there. So I'm doing the recruiting. But my job was no longer to recruit people and convince them to become nurses for different healthcare networks or pharmacists or med techs. No, no, no. Now my job was to take salespeople and convince them to become recruiters to recruit other salespeople to sell the product. Any of that sound familiar to like any of you guys? <laughs> and so there I am and I'm doing it and I'm having fun. I'm in South Florida and I'm, you know, getting to know all these healthcare companies and I'm walking into, you know, our competitors and I'm stealing their employees because they better be working for us and not themselves, right? Like, so it was, a, it was so much fun. And I'd been able to afford a luxury that like small town girl from Iowa, like I didn't think I could roll with that money. So I bought my first house. 
Um, I was just corner office, great cars. I had the clothes, you know, downtown ladies in Orlando, Florida. Like we, we had our thing going. And I was only 25. And mind you, I dropped out of college because I didn't think I'd live long enough to pay off my student loan debt. That's how dire cystic fibrosis diagnoses are. Not many of us who have been diagnosed have been successful in going to college because we have this moment in between treatments where we're sitting there and we're like, dude, we're just gonna be a financial burden to everybody. And that was my mindset. And so I dropped out, moved to um, Orlando, and then started taking on these jobs. And I found that no matter what happened, I'd be okay. And that I'll change when I was 26. I'll change. So I was at a crucible. It was a sudden realization, a moment that changes the entire trajectory of my life. And see, at that moment, my lung function had gotten so bad that there was no hope. The doctors called me end stage. And I'd moved out to San Diego to be very close to the drugs that were coming out on the market that were thought to halt the progression of the disease. Just nix it. <laughs> Except now I don't have money. I don't have insurance because I don't have a job. I'm thousands of miles away from friends or family. And I can't afford anything. I'm couch surfing off Craigslist. I was selling bootleg recruiting services for Amazon gift cards. And one hospitalization, I was in the year, I'll never forget this moment. I always get a little emotional talking about it. But the doctor comes in, he's like, okay, so you know, your lung function's down, you knew this already. It's, it's Pseudomonas aeruginosa. you've got a little aspergillus in there. We're not quite sure if it's MRSA, you know, that'll be seven to 10 days. Um, hey, do you, do you need any questions with insurance? I go, I actually don't have any. He goes, okay. And he goes, well, you know, we, we work with people like you. People like me. People like me? Who are the people like me? Because six months ago, six months ago, I was making just as much money as you were, bro. Six months ago, people called people like me for help. And now I'm the one needing the help. And so he walks out and the nurse comes in, she's hooking up the nasal cannula, um, which is a device to get oxygen. And then we've got another nurse accessing, you can see at the port. And I'm just sitting there like, people like me, how did it go so wrong that quickly? It was devastating. And she put something in front of me, she just hands me a stack of papers and says, your time's up. This is what end stage is. We want you to file for social security disability. You can make your own decisions, of course, but you know, then you'd have insurance and it'll give you roughly $1,200 a month in income. I lost everything, y'all. I lost it all. And I signed my life over to the government and I became legally classified as disabled legally classified as disabled. So now I can't even get a job because they have to track your income. And I had no income. And I sold everything I had, um, got a less nice car, if you will. And uh, I lived out of my car for a little bit. And I just hoped that I'd meet the right people that would let me couch surf long enough till I figured out what to do. And those are the good days. Because on the days I wasn't searching and hoping for couches and selling recruiting advice to, to try to get enough money for groceries, I was in the hospital. And in some ways the hospital became easier. And I started studying, what is it? What is it about these people who are at their crucible moments? And they take that crucible and then they make something of themselves. Because that can't just be books and movies and seminars and Rachel Hollis stuff. There has to be real life people, people like you, people like me. How is it when things happen that we don't approve of, things we have no control over, how do they bounce back? How? And I'm in my hospital room and I shut off that TV and I get only one place. I still have a voice. LinkedIn. <laughs> right? So I'm on LinkedIn and I start just Google, I'm um, not Googling, Googling, link searching CEOs. Because CEOs gotta know what's going on because like they wouldn't be a CEO if they weren't, right? Like 
that was my logic. <laughs> in my 20s, I didn't go to college, so work with me on this logic. And I was beyond fortunate that some incredibly amazing CEOs answered my call. And I said, hey, here's the deal. I'm in the hospital right now. The doctors don't know how long I have. I've got to do something to protect my mindset. I've got to do something to protect my mindset because if not, I'm dead. And I know this. And I go, so can you get on the phone with me? I, I know you're running major organizations. The co-founder of Netflix agreed. Sharon Lecter agreed. Louis Spagnuolo agreed. A guy who wrote The Habit Factor, uh, Martin Grenberg, agreed. Larry Linney, former NFL wide receiver, agreed. They don't know me. I'm a nobody. I am so low of a citizen that I am taking your tax money to live off of. And yet these CEOs agreed. And they let me interview them. And mind you, I'm not a trained interviewer. So it was pretty awkward. Not, not like, no, no husband. It was, it was awkward. And what I learned is there are certain mindset truths that all these people, they didn't know. I didn't have set questions, y'all. I wasn't trying to find an angle so I could sell it later. I'm just trying to live till a drug comes out to halt the progression. So let me tell you what happens when you're in a crucible. You take one step forward and then something else happens. And you start acting like this, like, I don't know if I can take a step forward. I don't know if it's a step back. I don't know what's happening in my life. I just know I want to live. I just know I want to be the person that inspires my family. Your title today is family reunion. Why is it family reunion? Because now times are more important than ever to come together. Did you know, did you know, only 30, Harris poll. Only 33%, 33% of Americans right now polled or consider themselves happy. If you've got a family of four, I need you to think about that. That means maybe one person in that household is happy. One person. And so I started studying and I started talking to these people and I started noticing common patterns. What makes somebody happy? What makes somebody survive that crucible moment? And how can I get some of that for myself? <laughs> I mean, come on, kind of had to have it. <laughs> and I found out there's four, four components of being the happiest, most vibrant self. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on all four of them because um, this is 45 minutes, <laughs> um, but I will hook you up all later on with some three hour master classes. We'll talk about that in the end. So there's four ways that science has figured out, and, and by the way, these interviews, I, I didn't go at it with a question, but I noticed commonalities and I noticed common threads. And so the four things, number one, perceived control. Perceived control. You know, there's a reason in the hospital they let you pick out your own food. You have to be able to feel like you were in control of something. So if that just hit a nerve with you, and sometimes my speaking does, if that hit a nerve with you right now, I want you to consider where in your life have you lost control? Where in your life have you lost control right now? Because it's affecting your happiness and it's affecting your family. And if you're like, you know, I don't, I don't know if I've lost control anywhere. Okay, great, what's pissing you off right now? What's frustrating you? You know why you're pissed off or frustrated about something? Because you have no control over it. Find out, answer that question, and then the next three components I teach you will help you shift past this. Second one, perceived progress. Perceived progress. So the first one, perceived control. Second one, perceived progress. Okay, let's talk about this one. When I was, oh goodness. I was diagnosed with diabetes in 2001. My blood sugars hit 1,236. Um, horrified number and I was in a coma roughly for about a month um, ventilator the whole the whole shtick right they're like there's no way she's coming out of this and I remembered you know it's interesting if for any of you if you've ever been in a coma <laughs> um, it's kind of meta but if you've ever been in a coma you hear things you sense energy around you you know I remembered all these nurses were having a birthday party 
um, because I could hear them talking about cake. And mind you, I'm out. Like, I'm not here, but I'm here. And they're talking about a birthday party. And they're talking about, like, how everybody gets to go to it. And I just remember thinking, like, I just want to get better so I have friends. (laughs) Like, nobody's visiting me in this space. I didn't know I was in a coma. I just knew I wasn't invited to that party. And so somehow, somewhere, before I even knew the science behind mind over medicine, before I even understood the power of the mind, before I became a master practitioner in neurolinguistic programming and a hypnotherapist, before I started keynoting all over the world, massive stages, man, I knew that all these other people having a birthday party that I wasn't invited to made me say, body, how do I get invited to that? How do I get invited? I started to get better. Now, I can't tell you anything else about that coma, but I can tell you when I woke up, I was like, can I come to the party? And the nurses were like, how'd you know we had a birthday party? And I'm like, I heard it, I wasn't invited. So what is that thing that you have in your heart that if you were in a coma, it'd force you to wake up for? Think about it. There's something pulling at your heart right now. Listen to it. Take a step towards it. Declare that on your life. Declare that on your life. I wanted to go to as many parties as possible before I died. And I don't think if I ever heard those nurses talking, I would have woken up. Because step three to having a happier, more productive life that I've discovered is connection. It's family reunion. Why are you all online right now? It's because we need to connect as humans. 33% of us are happy. Most of the people living under your roof are not happy. They are not okay. And we numb ourselves to this. We numb ourselves to this. Let me tell you something. For those of you married or in a relationship, how often are you telling your spouse you love them? Every day, right? I do it too. I do it too. I'm married. I'm engaged. Well, not married, but I'm engaged. Um, <laughs> um, just this morning, we're leaving. So I'm traveling right now. Um, right now, technically, I'm in Minneapolis, um, outside Stillwater. My family owns a bunch of, my in-laws own a bunch of marinas on the St. Croix, Mississippi. And Jeff helped me set up <laughs> this hotel room Zoom. So let me know what we should name the Buffalo. It's kind of cute. And, uh, you know, he walked out and I'm like, okay, bye, I love you. That ain't freaking connection. Is that what your love sounds like? I love you, bye, okay. That's not connecting. Watch this. Jeff, I love that you helped me set this room up. And <laughs> you deal with my craziness of getting everything organized and then kicking you out. Now you gotta go hang out by yourself. You know, but I, I love that you're the kind of man that is always there for me that is always supportive of me. I love you. Now, if I said that to him, I grabbed his hands and I just said that to him as he was walking out, how much different would his day have been? I did a uh, group coaching call a couple months ago and uh, it was for all salespeople, VPs, and uh, VPs, different organizations. And there was one girl who was like, she's a very successful woman, very crushing it. And she goes, you know, every morning my husband and kid want to have breakfast with me and I'm looking at my planner and I'm looking at all this stuff I got to do. And I'm just like, breakfast kind of a waste of time. And she, she likes her kids. She likes her family. It's not like they've got like horrible kids or family, right? She's just over it. Um, COVID, <laughs> protests, like human rights movement, all this stuff is coming at us. By the way, what happened to murder hornets? Can we just think about that? Carol Baskin killed her husband. Um, and she's like, breakfast just isn't a priority right now. And I go, there you go. Try saying my family is not a priority and see how quickly things change. And she goes, well, they are a priority, just not at breakfast. And I go, boo boo, they're not a priority. You sit with your kids 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the morning, you say, how's your day? Tell me about your life. What are you excited for? You know what my fiance and I do every single morning? We call it the three blessings and a prayer. We say, we announce what it is we are grateful for, what we feel blessed for, what we feel favored for. And some days are really tough. 
and we get we allow ourselves a little grace if we don't really have something that day we're allowed to bless our future you know we are allowed to speak the things that we want most so two blessings a future pretense and then your prayer your wish that thing you are committed to achieving despite any obstacle despite any crucible what is that thing every morning because that connects us because right now we're trapped inside looking at a zoom watching pre-recorded stuff and we're missing connection remember how they started saying social distancing and then they changed it to physical distancing because mental health became a problem here's the deal i want to encourage you i live in the hospital up to six months a year i've been gone from my friends and my family in an isolation ward 60 seven times you do not need to be physically next to somebody to feel connected you know what you got to do you got to be physically open you got to message that person you got to call that person in the moment you think of them and you send them something sweet hey i just finished my morning my, my three blessings and a prayer in the morning and your name came up i'm beyond grateful for everything you've done for me that i've never recognized you before love it if we could have a phone call sometime or you just call them up how many of you have lost touch with your parents right now how many of you don't feel connected to your kids or your spouse or your best friend that used to know everything about you you pick up that freaking phone you can do it you pick up that phone you go hey here's the deal watching this looney tune speaker <laughs> and um please forgive me for everything i've done wrong I know things with us have been tense. I've lost touch. I've done this wrong. Please forgive me. I'd love to start a new chapter with you. And first of all, they're probably not going to say anything because they're astonished. And then they're going to be like, no, there's never been a problem to begin with. Or, you know what? I'm not ready to forgive. But you know what? You took something. You did perceive progress. You took a step in the direction for where you want to be. It changes everything. You know, I, I firmly believe that hospital hallways have had more love and more prayer and more connection than churches, especially on wedding days. Because in that moment, you don't know if your family's gonna live. You find those words. Those words come out of you. They, they do. There's, there's no other, I, I need you to get that. I need you to get that. Live your life as if you live inside of a hospital because you will absolutely see a connection in a fabric. And that's what I want you to work on. If you don't listen to anything else I tell you today, be more connected. Be more connected. Pick up that phone, send that text. I love you. That, that, that's not connection, y'all. I love you for who you make me want to be is connection. Fourth thing I found about perceived happiness is the power of vision. It's the power of vision. And I'm gonna dedicate the rest of this to talking about the power of vision. Because even though I didn't understand what was happening in the coma, I just knew there was a party. I had a vision that I'd see that party. I know it's just a party, but for me it meant so much more. And I was in the hospital, I'm writing the book, right? Like I'm calling all these people on LinkedIn. I'm not watching Impractical Jokers, great show, Mur loves my dog. Um, I'm not watching that. You see, I'm not choosing that narrative. That narrative did not serve me. That narrative didn't know me, didn't know my struggle, didn't know my crucible. And so when I had those thoughts that came in that said, you're not gonna make it, or who are you to think you can defy the odds? Or what's your story? Don't you know this is, this is the struggle? Don't you know you're supposed to die soon? Allow it to be. You see, well-meaning people will tell you that because they're afraid of your potential because they're living in their own mediocrity. Well-meaning people will destroy your vision because your vision intimidates who they are. And you have the capabilities to say, no, boo-boo. I ain't signed up for that. Let me tell you who I am. Who are you? Have a vision, have a vision. You know, when I was a little girl, um, <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. 
So I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking kindergarten age, right? I, maybe first grade, who cares? And all the kids got to run around the playground, every single one of them. And they, they did this thing in PE class, which I call torture, where they made the people run a mile <laughs> over the playground. And so like all these little kids, you know, who have a boundless energy, boundless abundance, a, bum, a boundless, let's go with that, a boundless energy, start running. And the PE teacher looks at me and he goes, Kayla, let's go, go join him. <laughs> and I was scared because if I run, I cough and that's embarrassing. Um, it's embarrassing as female, it's embarrassing. I mean, hacking out the loogie, just not, not quite my finest hours. Um, and I go, I'm sick, let me, let me go to the nurse. And so I go to the nurse. And I'll never forget this, the nurse is like, I think you can run a mile. And I go, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, nope. And she goes, let's call your mother. And I'm like, yeah, mom will get me out of it. Like, mom knows, mom knows I, I'm, I'm scared. I don't want the kids to make fun of me. So I call my mom. They put her on speakerphone in the nurse's office. And I go, mom, they're running a mile in PE, and um, I don't feel good today. My mom goes, okay, you don't have to run. And I kind of, for a second, like, yes, yes, I win. Ha. <laughs> and then I hear this. But, and you know it's never good if your parents say but, <laughs> but if you don't work out, you'll just die earlier than all the other kids. Now, not the nicest thing for a parent to say to her struggling child, <laughs> but you know what? When I was 27 on social security disability, roughly 40% lung function, and I was hooked up to IVs. I put the IVs in the back seat of the car. I had uh, one of those wire coat hangers um, hanging over the mirror, connected to an IV drip bag, and I infused the three hour drive to a place in Palm Desert, California. Got out of the car, set up my IV pole, walked in to the studio, and eight hours later, I came out a certified Zumba instructor. I didn't want to die. Wasn't ready yet. Wasn't ready to give up. Nobody said I had a chance. And I did it. And I uh, became a certified Zumba instructor. Now, I'm not the best. <laughs> I have the lung function to get through my own class, right? But I want, I want you to get this. When you live with a vision of how great your life will be, and you can create that vision in an instant in your mind and you see it, you are well on your way. Because it doesn't matter what the world says around you, it's what you see. Do this right now, just humor me. Take your hand, take your hand, put over your eyes. Inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth. You don't need your eyes to see. What do you see? in your future. What do you see in your future? Because here's the deal. I wasn't acting like a patient. I wasn't looking like a patient. I wasn't talking like I was a patient. I was talking, looking, and acting like I was a speaker, like I was a writer, like I had a future, like I had friends, like I was connected, like I had control, like I perceived progress. Facts the level of intensity that I want you to leave this conversation with today. What is in your vision? Vision is the most important out of, uh, out of my ideas, you know, besides the connection of other people. I, I really want you to understand how important vision is to you. Vision can do things when nothing else can. Vision will get you through the lonely nights. Vision will get you through the tough times. Vision will get you through the rejection. Vision will get you through COVID. Vision will get you through. You know, I really want to recommend a book, and if you have not read it, just stop the thing again. Get on Amazon. It's uh, Dr. Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And did you know it was the Nazis who actually created retirement? Kid you not. Like, look it up. Um, the Nazis actually created retirement because they saw at 65, a man could not produce in the way that a man normally produces. Okay? And he starts to take up more than he gives back to society. And Hitler was having these conversations like, well, what do we do now? Now they're leeching the system. They're taking up more. 
And he talked to all these psychologists, psychiatrists back in the day, and they actually discovered something really fascinating. They said, you know what? If they're not producing, you just take away their vision and they'll die within 18 months. So they called it retirement. We don't even know it because it's so permeated in our culture now. One of my biggest mentors is a man by Jack Daly, great sales leader. And he's, gosh, 70 something. He'll kill me for not knowing his exact age. But Jack built a lot of really large sales organizations. We're talking hundreds of millions in revenue. And at 50, he, a little, little out of shape, a little bit, not, not, the, not the fittest 50 year old. And everyone was like, oh, you know, you're just getting older. You're just getting older. That's what happened. He goes, oh, why am I listening to that? You don't take advice from somebody more messed up than you in that category. Don't do it. And he didn't want to subscribe to the narrative that old age meant weak-minded, meant feeble, meant that his best days have been lived. He said, you know what? Mm -mm, that's not my truth. That's not my truth. This is my truth. And he started to run marathons at 50. Then, fascinatingly enough, he started taking swim classes. He's now done an Ironman on every single continent. An Ironman on every single continent. He's in his 70s, including Antarctica, because he had a vision for his life that was more compelling than the life he was living. I have a vision for my life, which is why I deep down believe CF has not taken over. It will never take over because my vision is so strong. I see a tomorrow, I see a future that is so strong. You've heard the story, and if you have not, allow me to remind you. Roy and Walt Disney. Walt invented this idea of a theme park for humans created by a mouse. Let that sink in. And he died before it opened. And an interviewer, a reporter was there, and they were talking to Roy, and they were like, man, Roy, don't you wish Walt could have been there to experience this? Don't you wish Walt could have been there to see this? And Roy looks at him and he goes, that's why you're a reporter. You don't get it. He saw this. He saw this. I know I did a good job at this keynote. If you can close your eyes and still see. If you can still see your future. You have a compelling thing. And here's the deal. If somebody tells you you can't do it, just don't let that's them being mediocre. That's them subscribing to a narrative. They couldn't do it doesn't mean you can't do it just because somebody else is putting their stamp on your life and saying it's not possible does not mean it's not possible. The question is, is do you believe that crap or not? So when I interviewed all these millionaires and actually a couple billionaires, now I'm friends with them. Very weird for a small town girl from Iowa. <laughs> College dropout, living in the hospital. It's like, I had no idea my life could be this incredible. But I remembered as a little girl, I said, and this is a true story, true story. I don't think I've ever shared this with anybody. But I'm feeling it. <laughs> my little brother, I mean, he's actually a big brother who's the state wrestling champion. So like this guy's, he's pretty jacked. Um, but he was 13 months younger, younger um, close in age because my parents thought I was going to die and they, they wanted a kid. Um, and he beat me up, right? Like brother, sister fights. Like it probably wasn't bad, but in my head it was like, oh, the worst fight I've ever been in. He beat me up and I remembered running to my room and crying. And as I was there and I was just like, sit down, I was just bawling my eyes out. And of course, when you have CF, you can't just cry like a normal freaking human. You gotta like have the snot and the mucus and this. Like, <laughs> and then I can't breathe. I'm horrible, disastrous, don't, don't do it. And I remember thinking, I'm gonna learn how to fight with my words rather than my fists. <laughs> Literally, and that was the vision. That was the vision. I want to learn how to fight with words better than anybody can fight with their fists. Y'all, COVID's wiped out most speakers. I'm still speaking two to three times a week. My book that I wrote inside hospital walls became an international bestseller within the first 48 hours. It's on Amazon. Now it's on Audible because they wanted an Audible version the vision. That's what's keeping me alive. That's what's keeping me going. That's why I refuse to give up. And that's what I want to leave you here with today. If you're in a crucible moment, which by the way, if you're watching this, you are. And if this year you've prayed harder than you have any other year of your life, number one,
get back your control. Number two, take action. Have perceived progress. Be at cause, not at effect. Create the ripples of your future. Don't let the ripples of your future happen to you. Connect. Pick up the dang phone. And if you gotta send a text, you know, send a, send a warming text, right? Like, hey, I was thinking about you, I'd love to have a conversation. But then you call that person. Don't let them call you. That's lazy. You ain't lazy, you're better than that. You pick up that phone, you call them, you tell them what they mean to you. You tell them where you've gone wrong. You tell them you love them. I don't care if they're in the next room. Sweetest moment I had as a kid is when I first got my phone. I was a teenager. And uh, I was in my bedroom, my parents were downstairs, and I was mad at them. I was so mad at them because I'm a teenager, my parents don't understand me, and I know everything there is to ever know about anything in the world, always. <laughs> Some of that hit nerve. And my dad calls, and I'm like, he's in the living room. I'm not going to answer. Then he calls again. And I'm like, okay, is something actually wrong? How many of you get two phone calls in a row and you just immediately think the other person's like burning in a car somewhere? You know, my fiance doesn't answer my calls and I know he's driving. I'm like, oh my gosh, he died. Like, like it just, it, it, there's no like, oh, maybe, you know, the phone's in the back seat. It's like, nope, he died. Like he has to die in that moment. It's crazy. And the dad calls a third time. I'm finally like, what? Because I'm angry. He goes, nothing. I know you're upset with us right now, but we love you and we're very proud of you. Well, I'm mad at you. I just hang up. And I said their name. One of the sweetest moments I had. You know, people don't need to admit back to you how much your words mean to them. But it does make a difference. It does make a difference. So if you're fighting with somebody right now, be the bigger person. Be the bigger person. And then step four, have a vision. Don't start acting like you're defeated. Don't start acting like you don't have hope for tomorrow. Don't start acting like something's wrong. No, 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 no. Believe in the future that you can see. Believe in the destiny that you're creating. Understand that the bad things that are happening are the breakthrough. The setbacks are the future success. The adversity is the advantage. The victimhood, nope, nope, you're a victor. I need you to trust your vision. And I need you to believe it and embody it and be it. You combine all four of those. <laughs> you ain't gonna be the same person in a year. So ending it out, yeah, I wrote that book. It did reasonably well. Now I keynote all over. I have free master classes all online, teaching you more mindset success strategies. And that's the vision. That's the goal. That's the life purpose. None of that would have happened if I would have been healthy. None of that wouldn't have happened if I would have done that math and been like, oh my gosh, my time's almost up. You know, when people call me and they say, hey, we got a week, we need a keynote presenter or other one backed out. I need a Hail Mailer. I'm always going to be that Hail Mary because I got 10% more time left. And this is exactly what I'm meant to be doing with it because I believe, I believe that my vision is so strong that you'll be hearing from me many, many years, many years. I've already beat the life expectancy. I'm one of the oldest and fittest people with cystic fibrosis in the world. What are you beating? What's the setback that's going to be your success? What's the adversity that you're going to make the advantage? What is your battle that you're going to make your breakthrough? What is it? I actually want to know. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to get out this phone and you're going to make a note to call a few people and then text the word inspire, inspire, I-N-S-P-I-R-E, inspire to the number 66866. And I'm going to hook you up with all my free masterclass training. All of it. Both free. Inspire 66866. Because the goal, the vision, is I want to connect with you. 
I know I'm on a computer. I know this is pre-recorded. I know that I, I can't see your face right now. So it's, a, it's an interesting feeling because you can see mine. So I want to leave you with your three blessings and your wish. Take the time to do that today. And then take the time to reach out to me and let me know what actions you're going to take. Because girl, you've got this. You've got this. I've been where you are. Maybe not exactly. But I know what it feels like to be at a crucible and not know if there's a tomorrow. You can get through. You can get through.